if if it were easy, if it were that AI agents, you could just show them a task and they would go and do it and they would do it perfectly, we would not need an agentic company in the first place. Welcome to episode 38 of It's About Data. Our guest this time is Lok Lakshmanan, co-author of the book Generative AI Design Patterns and co-founder of Oban.ai. We have a legend in the tech space and in the O'Reilly space and machine learning, data, AI. That's Lok Lakshmanan. I think the last I checked, you had written seven books. Is that correct? Did I get it right this time? And you, you did, just you published one in November and I'm about halfway through. That is Generative AI Design Patterns, which is fabulous so far. But I'll, I'll hand it over to you for a second to do a quick intro and then we have some questions. Yeah, absolutely. Thank, thank you, Matt. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, um, my background, I started out doing uh, pattern recognition, machine learning, computer vision uh, back in the day, um, you know, in weather forecasting. So, uh, you know, tornadoes, flash floods, hail, etc. Back in the days when the only people who had large amounts of data, enough to do ML, were people in astronomy and meteorology and so on. Mm. And then about 10 years ago, I took a sabbatical from my job, joined Climate Corporation, which was a new startup by a fellow named Dave Freeberg on precision agriculture for farmers, helped build the data science team there. And that was my first exposure to both cloud and deep learning because uh, 2014 was when the AlexNet paper first came out. And that combination um, really, really, really got me excited. And I, I got to be part of Google Cloud when it was just about getting started and was a great rocket ship. And now I'm co-founder and CTO of a company called Obin, Obin AI. Uh, we build vertical AI agents. So AI agents for finance, specifically focused on uh, private credit and being able to uh, streamline many of the processes in private credit from underwriting to monitoring to load reviews. Fantastic. And so first question I want to ask you kind of connects your very recent book with Obin. And mm -hmm. so I'm actually going to read a sentence from the book. And this might come off as an aggressive question, but it's not intended that way. <laughs> and I, I'm aggressive asking this because- is Aggressive it, is good. Okay. We, we go for the gutter on this one. That's right. But I think you'll have a good answer. That's why I'm asking this question. So in the book, um, this is in the introduction where you're talking about agents. And so you say, mm -hmm. at the time of writing, agentic behavior remains an aspirational goal for applications built on foundation models, non-determinism, hallucinations, and various other failure modes pose challenges to building auto fully autonomous AI applications. And so that's a very sober take, I think. It's a very realistic take, which we appreciate. Uh -huh. But I think you went from that perspective to building mm -hmm. an agent company. And I think there's a reason for that. So tell us about like how you're making agents work in spite of these limitations. Absolutely. If, if it were easy, if it were that AI agents, you could just show them a task and they would go and do it and they would do it perfectly, we would not need an agentic company in the first place, right? So I think the the, the word agentic is a pretty, this is uh, Andrew Eng who kind of coined this term. Yeah. It captures this uh, gray area between uh, agents, which have been around for a very long time in computer science, this idea that uh, you have autonomously acting things that perceive, reason, and act in their environment. Uh, and so you have the, that as, a, as your goal, aspirational goal, but how much do they actually perceive versus how much do you tell them what to look for? How much do they reason versus how much do you show them examples of good thought processes to model themselves after? How much do they act autonomously versus you give them tools with guardrails that they can do in a way that is safe and secure? Right? So, uh, no, and I think that that pretty much answers the question of it's not fully autonomous. Yeah, you have to you have to guide these agents, and you and there is where a lot of the interesting behavior comes, because these things don't work out of the box. All like even right now we're working on a problem in which the starting accuracy is anywhere from forty to sixty percent, mm, and wow. now we look at that and say, okay, this is not ready to be put out there uh, for re like realistic use. However, I do know that over time, we'll be able to get it 
uh, to a point at which you can you can you can use them as trusted assistants to humans. Right. It's really interesting the point you make, which is that in a certain way agents are not new, but in I think in very basic ways they are new. Uh, mm -hmm. Which is that in the past what we had is we had you know essentially rules based automation, right? And they're doing relatively simple you know relatively simple tasks. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, so basically based on a rule, you know that agent was you know you know was empowered to make a decision, but it's a very it was very low level. Mm -hmm. Whereas today, what well, you I mean, what, uh, what, well, go ahead, yeah, dive in. So I'll push back on that. Right, okay, go for it. So, uh, like agents. Like when you think about it, what are agents? Agents, like when you think about them, they need to be self-correcting. And mm -hmm. they've been around for a very long time. You think right. about a Kalman filter. What is a Kalman filter? But something that observes its environment, takes the error measure, feeds it back. Well, you could say that it is deterministic. Yeah, it's a mathematical equation. It's deterministic. However, when you see a guided missile, right, it doesn't look deterministic. Right. It looks, mm -hmm. it's basically using the observation, it's correcting its trajectory, and it's following. Sure, these, you know, we, we can call them rules-based things, but at the end of the day, everything is math, math at some point. True, but, true, yeah. true. No, I, I fully hear you there. It's kind of like the old you know, saying of like, it depends on what the, the meaning the, the, the meaning <laughs> of the word is, is. Exactly. Uh, which is that, I mean, when you look at, I mean, things, you know, today we look at, of course, we call now, you know, euphemistically, classic AI. Right. <laughs> you know, like which we've done for <laughs> like all of learning. classic you know, all AI. Of, you know, even though the algorithms you know go back decades, we've really only uh, outside of a few sectors like you're talking mm -hmm. about, have really mm -hmm. only been using you know machine learning in mm -hmm. critical mass for the last decade. And yes, I would agree with you that there, there's no such thing as some you know unless you're doing some have something that's totally rules based, mm -hmm. which that would be term deterministic. Okay. Yes, obviously you have algorithms there, but they're fairly linear algorithms Correct. in other words it wasn't whereas when you and and it, and it was it was much narrower and again I, I i may be really driving myself into a swamp here uh, <laughs> but on the other hand when you look at say for instance generative models mm -hmm. these are basically probability models on steroids without any context whether you're talking about language whether you're talking about let's say like geospatial molecular mm -hmm. chemistry that type of thing so i've got to mm -hmm. believe there's just there's a huge difference between the types of you know you know agent you know basically behavior that we had gotten used to in the classical era yeah. compared to what we're doing today definitely definitely i think this idea of uh drawing from a distribution mm -hmm. is new in a lot of fields as you said tony right and because you're drawing from you're sampling from that distribution it looks uh uh, very different from something where you have a very deterministic set of rules and the, the, the program behaves identically regardless of any time you run it, right? Given the same inputs, you always get the same outputs. Is the kind of computer programs that many of us have been used to. And so this idea of a generative model that draws out of a sampling distribution looks extremely new. But again, when you get back to agents, they correct themselves which we've had with even with Calvin mm -hmm. filters for a very mm -hmm. long time. The other thing that they do is they collaborate with other agents. Mm. And that's the other thing that we've had where you've had multiple sensors, each of which are independent, and you need to go ahead and do sensor fusion of, of those kinds. And that is also an example of agentic behavior that existed well before you had uh, generative AI models. But uh, but I, I, I will totally give you that this is a lot more popular and a lot more prevalent now than it is like it's it's no longer rocket science. Interesting. And that maybe that's the big change with chat GPT is we took something that kind of resembles rocket science and we made it very accessible to the public. And to me, as I read your book, mm. a lot of the things you're talking about, like, you know, using a tree and crawling different paths of mm. reasoning chains. That sounds a lot like simulation, right? And simulation is a world that you come from, I, I right. believe. So yes. tell me about that connection between uh, LLMs and generative AI and the simulation background you come from. Uh, yeah, that that's the connection I had not drawn before, frankly, Matt. So it's it's, it's interesting mm -hmm. that, that that you would bring that. But yes, I can see how when you're reading the tree of thoughts mm -hmm. uh, pattern, which is what I think you're referring to. Yes. You, we are basically having an agent uh, follow a path, find that it doesn't work anymore, backtrack up to where it had more options, 
and follow the next set of paths down. Right. Uh, this is how chess used to be played before, uh, you know, the uh, you know like the old chess programs used to basically do this kind of a tree search. Mm. And in some sense, what we are now doing is that we have these extremely powerful agentic model, agentic or frontier models that do small tasks well. And you're saying, how do I combine this servant that I have that does really good things in a small sense and have it? Give it a guidance. Have it go do a go. Have it go explore a space. And whenever you do exploration of a space, you're going to run into a dead end, and you have to backtrack, and you have to you have to follow the next next thing. So in some sense, I was I was actually trying thinking of it as much more of a of a search strategy, where or or, for, or of uh, getting yourself out of a maze where you cannot see the big picture, but you have you have an agent that only sees ahead of it. Now, this is how a lot of robotics programs work. This mm. is how chess programs used to be written when they could only look a few moves ahead. They could not look very far ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Another another question about the book. How on earth did you synthesize so much information so quickly? Because it's so what, your first book that I was exposed to is BigQuery, The Definitive Guide. And right. great book. It's you know mm -hmm. about BigQuery, of course, but that's a mature space, right? We've had SQL databases since the 1980s. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's relatively straightforward to write about the technical details of a system mm -hmm. from that perspective. But like how on earth in your writing process did you gather so much of this information that's pretty much brand new to talk about like LLM design <laughs> patterns and such? Uh, the funny thing is, the funny thing, Matt, is I think it all depends on your starting point. Okay. And I'll, I'll tell you a secret. Before I joined Google, I had never written a line of SQL in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Makes all. sense. Yeah. Right? Wow. Because I, was, I, was, I was doing images. I yeah. was doing yeah. radars. I was doing images. And in fact, I started to work with the BigQuery team and BigQuery was the first SQL database that I used. And essentially, I was writing the book maybe a year, year and a half after I started after writing SQL. So, in some sense, the BigQuery book was much newer topics and very different because I had mm. just learned those things. Whereas uh, machine learning and the neural networks and uh, you know uh, generative models, these are all based on things that I've had all of my career. So, I think in some sense. Uh, it's a lot easier to learn new things when you have uh, when you've grown up in that space, which is why you know uh, I think we all have become really good at understanding what generative models are because we started with ChatGPT and you saw how it worked, and then each evolution things keep getting better. But imagine someone that's coming completely new to the space. Yeah. All of a sudden, they have to know about tool calling. They have to know about code generation. They have to know about the thinking modes, and they have to. And each of these things, we were lucky in that we got introduced to them in at least two months apart. Well, yeah. well, there's so many ways that we could take that discussion because I mean, what, one of my questions always is, well, can I AI help that? But but I think I want to table that, um, which is I I want to kind of cut to the chase in terms of in navigating this new environment, both mm -hmm. with generative, which are only just getting to understand. And now agents, and of course, agents are not necessarily synonymous with generative. Agents could actually you know, trigger basically a classical yeah. machine learning model or whatever. But anyway, mm -hmm. how do we essentially up our confidence level mm -hmm. as we're dealing with the intersection of these two you know, fairly new and, for most of us, unfamiliar disciplines? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, one of the things is, uh, I think this goes back to the I, uh, even Isaac Asimov, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Ultimately, who makes decisions is a human, mm. right? We we almost never want a machine to make decisions other than in places like high frequency trading, where the machines have been making decisions on billions of dollars for a long time. But in most scenarios, we're talking about human judgment, humans making the decisions, humans being uh, finally accountable for whatever it is that they're doing. You cannot jail uh, an AI model. You cannot threaten it with consequences, right? Uh, so uh, in a lot of society is based on this idea that there's consequences when you do bad things, and therefore we expect people to behave 
uh, honorably, ethically, et cetera, because there's all there's like some bad consequences at the end of it. Given that, the idea then is that whenever you build AI systems, agentic AI systems, you want to build them in a way that it makes the human decision making better or it makes the human decision making faster or it makes the human decision making more robust, right? So more accurate, more robust, more scalable. It has to improve the human decision making process. Uh, if it's about replacing it, I'm not that interested. But if it's about improving it, I am totally am. Interesting. So I know it's very early days for Obin, but tell us about how you're establishing that relationship between human and machine there. Like what kinds of work will the agents do? What mm -hmm. kinds of decisions will require a human in the loop? Right. So, I mean, one of the early, you know, you, your customers tell you the best best thing. So yeah. uh, uh, talking to one of our customers uh, at, at early in our, early in the open journey, and one of them said, oh, don't, don't tell me the AI is going to write an IC memo for me. The reason I got into this whole business is because I want to get in front. I want to go understand a company. I want to sell mm -hmm. it to all the investors and say, well, this is why we bought this company. Right? That is the thing that is fun for me. But here's all these other things that I have to do that keeps me from doing the fun things. And I think, forget the specific instance of what was fun for this particular person, but I think that resonates in, across a lot of old industries. You have, a lot, you have a few things that people do that are fundamentally fun. This is why they, they became uh, that thing they are in the first place, doctors want to cure patients, right? That is what makes it fun. That's what they want to do. They don't want to do medical transcription. So if you're saying, what am I going to do with AI? Go find the medical transcription kinds of things. And that's kind of what we do in the financial space. We find the things that people would rather not do, people that, that is drudgery or things that are done and when people do it, it's inaccurate, or when people do it, it's not scalable. We find those bottlenecks, and we use AI to help resolve those bottlenecks. And presumably, trust is front and center, because that's one of the things you mention in the book, is we're still right. basically having issues with trust, with reliability. Mm -hmm. And if I'm going to have my AI do write an email or transcribe medical records, I have to know it can do it at least as well as I can. As you said, and, humans and mess things up that, too. It, <laughs> It needs to give you confidence that it is doing it well. Yeah. So it, today, like, you know, again, we see this in a lot of AI products. You see things being cited. The citations are very, very, it's a key indicator that something is happening. You're hoping the citations themselves aren't hallucinated because they could be. But then you also see that you have agentic AI systems that once they generate a citation, they go and check the link and they come back and say, this citation is actually correct. Right? So you have a citation checker and you have an essay writer, and these two agents work collaboratively so that you know that whenever the essay writer says, here's a citation, the citation checker has checked it and made sure that whatever this essay writing agent is doing is correct. So you do those kinds of things yeah. all the time. You basically build in uh, a reviewer uh, agent that reviews everything that is being done by the agent that does the work. And, and provides the, uh, the, um, the trust uh, to, the, uh, to, to the human user, who's the human who's finally making the final, de final decisions, that this step is what's done for these reasons. And I have validated this step, I've verified it, I've checked the math, it is correct. So it sounds really like that the first step of this mm -hmm. is really working from the ground up to establish, to establish confidence. Correct. Yeah, Correct. Gotcha. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate you taking the time to do this. And uh, I mean, this industry is changing so fast that maybe we can have another conversation in some months to come. <laughs> yeah, we'll be following your progress. I yeah. think we've barely scratched the surface yeah, here. Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Tony. Appreciate Thanks for talking. You. See you. Bye-bye.